please join me in the prayer for illumination. O God of promise, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ is trustworthy and true. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may it rise up in us this day like a gift from the spring of the water of life to refresh our thirsty souls. Amen. And now let us read responsively Psalm 148. Alleluia. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, all the angels. Praise the Lord, all the heavenly hosts. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven and heavens, and in the waters of the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded, and they were created. The Lord is in Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, rulers and all judges of the wor worlds. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for the name of the Lord only is exalted, and the splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the children's people, and praise for all loyal servants, the children of Israel, and people who are near to the Lord. Hallelujah. The Gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John, the 13th chapter, verses 31 through 35. It can be found on page 108 in the New Testament in your pew Bibles. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another.
Jesus' imperative to love one another is about the highest ground to which we can aspire. It's a short passage with a big message, and I had to laugh because um, I hadn't really, a true confession, I hadn't really spent a lot of time looking at the lectionary yet, and um, I hadn't even read this passage, and last week was just an extremely busy week with things that I had planned and then things that I couldn't even anticipate that happened. And I uh, facetiously remarked to someone, well, my sermon's getting shorter and shorter. I think it's something along the lines of, God loves us, God loves us so much, go out and love. So, you know, the end. Um, but I did come up, <laughs> yeah, no, sit down. That's about the, the uh, reaction with the confirmands this weekend, anytime we gave them a short out. They're like, oh yeah, we're all over that. No, no, settle down, I still got a few words. Love one another, love one another, love one another. Any questions? I think I've seen memes like that on Facebook. Um, this, not the meme part, but love one another, love one another, love one another, is how I heard a preacher describe these words which begins, these words are some of the early ones in a long stretch of scripture called the farewell discourse in John and where we find Jesus' final words to and prayers for his disciples. A few verses before this, Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples, perhaps prepping them to carry on the movement after he's gone. And this short passage begins with that big message, the new commandment that Jesus gives his disciples to embody. But it turns out that love one another, part of this commandment isn't what's new. The commandment to love goes back much further than Jesus of Nazareth. Before Jesus spoke the commandment, gathered around um, the table on that last night with the disciples, it was rehearsed throughout the Jewish tradition. I'm sure the, God, the disciples knew it, read it, prayed it, committed it to their lives. Um, sorry. Um, the commandment to love one another was familiar to them, old, not new. That is, until the qualifying phrase as I have loved you. Now that part was new. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. An old commandment with a new meaning. I read a story about a photographer who moved to New York City after losing his job, which seems like the wrong time to move to New York City. But he took his camera and he decided to have this project of uh, photographing 10,000 New Yorkers on the street and creating a catalog of the city's inhabitants. He began crisscrossing the city, covering thousands of miles on foot, all an attempt to capture New Yorkers with his camera. Somewhere along the way, he began to interview his subjects in addition, and he asked them two questions. What's your greatest struggle? And give me a piece of advice. Alongside their portraits, he includes quotes and short stories from their lives. It's now a blog, Humans of New York, and his project has over 20 million followers. One of them is an older woman photographed with wisps of gray hair sticking out from a furry cap with a little bit of mascara under her wrinkled eyes and a fuzzy umbrella in the background. She said, when my husband was dying, I said, Mo, how am I supposed to live without you? And this is what Mo told her. Take the love you have for me and spread it around. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Take the love you have for me and spread it around. How are the disciples supposed to live without Jesus? Take the love I've shown you and pour it out into the world, which evidently God is doing just right now. <laughs> just as I have loved you, so you should love one another. In, other, in the other Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus gives many imperatives like turn the other cheek 
go the second mile. If they ask for your tunic, give them your cloak as well. In, Gos- in John's gospel, there is only this one imperative, love one another. That's the only one. Take the love I have poured out for you, the love you've felt from me, and pour it out all over the world. Pour it out on the people around you, strangers and friends, from the cashier at the grocery store to the difficult family member. Take the love I've shown you and extend it to the people around you every day, in every interaction, to every creature, in every place. Take the love you've known through me and give it away again and again and again. Your life and the life of your community can't help but point to God if we do so. I also read a story about a pastor in Seattle, Washington, and um, one day as she was closing up her janitor or the janitor for the church, the custodian came to her. This was during the uh, government shutdown. And the janitor was worried about all the TSA workers who were required to work but were receiving no paycheck. And he said, what can we do to help them? Because I'm worried about them. So she got on the phone and um, found out what the, what the um, how, how many there were at the airport and um, what the rules were for giving gifts to government workers and the church decided to buy 150 $10 gas cards and so she went down to the local Walmart to buy um, gas cards and it took quite a while because you've got to um, activate them one at a at a time, and the cashier was so excited about what she was doing, he started telling everybody that was piling up, you know what this church is doing? And so people started asking her about the church, and some people added a few more gas cards, and um, it didn't just stop there. One of her church members was reading the church newsletter as she was, as the uh, church member was in line at Starbucks, and felt moved to buy the Um, coffee and food for the car behind them. Those may seem like little things and and yet they touch people's life. It's one way of um, showing, pouring out the love that God has for us. Perhaps a cascade of generosity. Certainly, um, but love is not always so easy or so fun, is it? Certainly the disciples found themselves in lots of places in which love was hard to come by following Jesus' death. They experienced fear. They were anxious, concerned about how they would carry on the message, if they would be persecuted. You and I don't have to think too long and hard to know that there are places in our lives or in the world in which love is hard to come by in our relationships with those we work with perhaps or with a family member, when we've been disappointed or hurt by someone or in the politics in our nation and sometimes even in the church. Henry Nouwen wrote, if we wait for a feeling of love before loving, we may never learn to love well. Mostly we know the loving thing to do. When we do love, even if others are not able to respond with love, we will discover that our feelings catch up with our acts. The kind of love Jesus commands the disciples, commands us, is the defining characteristic of God and Jesus' life. It's also the defining characteristic of the Christian church to show God's love to the world in every way that we can think of, to keep the currency of God's love moving around in the world long after that last night that Jesus had with the disciples. I read an essay on love. The title drew me in, Apocalyptic Love. The author wrote, I know that love, like peace, is difficult. Ask someone who's been married for more than 20 years. Mutual subordination is not a natural practice. People who claim their marriage has always been happy either lie or feebly conceal an uneasy hegemony. He goes on to say, I don't know how to love you as Christ loves us. If you do, please clue me in. 
In the meantime, what's to be done with this new commandment? Commandments aren't issued for default behaviors. We don't get commanded to do the things we already always do, right? You can blame biology or the fall, but lying, sexual betrayal, killing, and covetousness are quintessentially human. Perhaps I can learn through a lifetime effort how not to harm my neighbor, but don't ask me to do the impossible and love him too. And he goes on to say, the more I reflect on this new commandment, the more I apprehend it apocalyptically, a revelation of something already here, yet hidden from human sight. If you ask me to love my wife, he says, I'll give you dozens of reasons, none of which are truly answers your question. In the end, I love by faith and grace, not by sight, knowledge, or certainty. St. Jerome, one of the early church's fathers, wrote about John, who wrote the Gospel John, in his old age, would remind those around him to love one another. When he was asked why he said this so often, he replied, because it's what our Lord commanded. And if it's all you do, it is enough. As I have loved you, living the way Jesus lived, choosing love even when love is hard to come by, extending love when people act unloving. Take the love God has for you and keep pouring it out, giving love away again and again, for it is enough, even not if, even though we do it imperfectly. If it's all we do, it is enough. It is life-giving and life-honoring, and it is our life's work. This commandment would be enough to sustain the disciples as they figured out how to live after Jesus was gone. And it's enough to stay, sustain us through challenging times. Each time we choose love, we bear witness to God's all-encompassing and radical love for the world. May God give us the grace to allow such love to be the defining characteristic of our lives and our church. Pray for faith and grace in all things and pray for ap apocalypse of love. I like that. Pray for the apocalypse of love, for it to come and for there to be nothing else but. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for pouring out your love upon us and our lives. Enable us, inspire us, encourage us, and send us to share your love in the world. Amen. Thank you.